the precompile problem. <sighs> Let's see. So outline first. I want to motivate that this is actually a problem. Then uh, show some benchmarks of how well different Wasm engines uh, can solve our problem. Um, then the fun stuff starts, which is the uh, shootout versus EVM and the uh, big num uh, optimizations that Alex was referring to. So, <clears throat> what is a precompile? It's it's just EVM bytecode. Um, I mean, in theory, you can see it that way, but it's a special case where. Uh, that bytecode gets a discounted um, cost, so much cheaper gas cost than every other <laughs> contract on the on the chain. Um, so these are implemented natively in clients, uh, in theory. So with our optimized DVM, we actually um, are looking towards imp implementing all the precompiles in EVM bytecode, and then clients can use an optimized. EVM to run the precompiles instead of native code. But anyway, so there's like uh, something like eight precompiles right now in the clients. Um, so these were the, the first four that were there since August. Um, and these four more were added in October. So three of them are related to the uh, elliptic curve uh, pairings. And, and then there's a wish list. Um, sorry, I forgot to add the links to the, these later ones, but they are like generalized, uh, <laughs> uh, generalized elliptic curve multiplication, and that, then that was extended uh, to um, generalized pairings over, over certain curves, but uh, I guess in general the point is most um, precompiles that people want are related to, uh, yeah, to uh, cryptography and like big number cryptography. Uh, hash functions are one of the exceptions that people want that, that aren't cryptography, but um, <clears throat> anyway, so why is our precompiles a problem? Why don't we just keep adding um, more precompiles? So there's there's two reasons: a technical and a social. Um, so the technical one, uh, actually, Martin introduced me to this term: that the uh, trusted computing base. Uh, every precompile expands this trusted computing base. It's like the the surface area um, for you know, consensus bugs and complexity. So, and we've seen this even uh, empirically in the Ethereum clients, <laughs> like this, this gas roll right here, if you try to implement it, is insane. Um, I tried to do this in JavaScript and it was like uh, ridiculous to get it actually to match up with the other implementations. Um, and then it showed up as um, consensus bugs, you know, uh, in the uh, that we found through fuzz testing uh, shortly before Byzantium was activated. So luckily, before, not after. Um, and <laughs> luckily, what with the with these. Um, with the pairing precompiles, we weren't as lucky, and we actually found one um, after. We were lucky that we found it, and um, I actually found it, and I'm quite proud of that, because I don't know anything about elliptic curves. But, uh, so here, I just wanna point out that like this test case is to be written. I think the EIP still says that. Um, because people love to, uh, yeah, expand the, the trusted computing base, but writing test cases, not so much. Um, so, yeah, so from a core dev 
point of view, uh, precompiles are a big pain. <sighs> so that's just the, the technical reasons not to do precompiles. The social reasons, uh, it's just, it's like a slippery slope, you know, you add one precompile, then you know, everybody wants to precompile. Uh, they eat up, you know, more and more time on, on core dev calls. But uh, more recently, I've been making um, technical arguments against them, but people, you know, say, well, it's so easy to just add, you know, it's like a, it takes me, you know, half an hour to add uh, a precompile to the code base. Um, but there's actually a philosophical dilemma, which is like, you know, why does your code deserve special treatment over everybody other's code? You know, is all code equal and should be treated fairly and all have to pay the same cost? Or, you know, should like your hash function get, you know, be subsidized by everybody just because, you know, the CEO of your blockchain is like buddies with Vitalik? Is that why, you know, um, is it really widely used or, and, who was behind those, um, you know, snark precompiles that were added to Byzantium in the first place? It's like the Illuminati. Is <laughs> like is, um, yeah. <clears throat> the Illuminati is inserting its precompiles into the uh, Ethereum. Okay, so. <laughs> Precompiles are bad. How do we solve the problem? Use a compiler engine. Um, so if we use a compiler engine, what precompiles become practical? Uh, so one of our test cases is doing uh, like a 10 point match, uh, pairing match. And we can see even uh, in this benchmark, if we assume 100 milliseconds is the cutoff, then um, no, not even an optimizing compiler engine gets it below that cutoff. So uh, it's still out of reach. Although there are some later results, so maybe um, maybe it's closer. Uh, but the 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 Rust code for this um, multi-point pairing uh, was optimized. But anyway, just as another look. So for two-point pairings, we can do two-point pairings. Uh, in an optimized compiler, not perhaps not in uh, in a single-pass compiler. This V8 liftoff at the end is the the only single-pass uh, compiler in the in the set. So anyway, it's. Um, last year at the end of DevCon, what, um, and one of Alex's, uh, pivotal points that was highlighted, um, uh, yeah, the good buddy of ours, Alexi, suggested, you know, we should just try to introduce interpreter engines as a stepping stone, because we couldn't really decide, well, interpreter engines aren't really that useful. Um, because they don't, they're not fast enough to run uh, the cryptography that people want, but compiler engines, on the other hand, are a lot more complex. Um, and this discussion may sound uh, kind of weird to other people who aren't embedded in the Ethereum, you know, core dev client maintainer community. Uh, why don't we just use a compiler engine? There's a bunch of reasons. I actually wanted to open it up um, so that uh, so that we can move on after this. Um, I think uh, maybe fine art team Guillaume and Paul might have some ideas on. <laughs> Does anybody think that Ethereum should just use compiler engines? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, you can a, a non a, a a compiler that is fairly naive and makes bad register decisions, um, uh, and is uh, engineered to so that you can have more confidence that it's correct at the price of generating less efficient code, uh, should still substantially outperform an interpreter uh, while meeting the confidence goals. That that is the thing that at least this slide implies is the th thing driving you to an interpreter. I would argue that there exists no compiler that meets those confidence goals. Like, to, it, yeah, and the ones that we have, like liftoff, they're massive, massive dependencies that bring in tons of other code and attack surface. So, like at Parity, we just say we're not confident this is actually correct and don't use it. Okay, so um, I think one should write such a compiler. <laughs> Isn't Parity trying to do that? Yeah. <laughs> and how's that going? Pretty good, pretty good. Um, yeah, so um, I, also, I happen to be part of the guest team, and yeah, that's roughly the same, uh, the same uh, uh, approach. Like, we don't want to bring a big piece of code that we don't fully understand that's going to break the consensus. Otherwise, you know, it's production code. If uh, something goes wrong, uh, that means long nights of uh, with people yelling at you. Um, so we want to get uh, we want to get the, the stuff understood first, like experimented with, and then uh, maybe experiment with. Uh, with compilers, uh, speed is uh, comes after safety. I agree with that. Yeah. Okay, so everybody agrees that. Well, one thing I think that uh, Ethereum should not decide if it's if the clients are compiled or not. They just decide in the consensus, and maybe the problem is the metering. What metering should be taken account more? A low, you know, a more conservative metering that uh, gives a high price so interpreters can run it. But clients should decide, as far as they follow the consensus rules, they should decide whatever they want. Maybe they use some cache uh, pre -compi so the, the compiler, maybe in, in WASM, or maybe in native code, or, you know, they, they, can, they can choose whatever they, they, they want. But I think Ethereum should not decide if, uh, Mm, uh, compile it or interpret it. Yeah, that's definitely what we mean here. When I say use the compiler engine, um, that's short for like tune the gas cost to compiler speeds, which would make it really difficult for an interpreter to keep up. Cool, so, okay, so when we move on, don't keep asking the question, why don't we just use compilers? Because there's issues. Uh, anyway, you know, there's some argument that it should not be such a big issue because there's literally no difference between interpreted execution and compiled execution. Um, except, uh, you know, as Paul <laughs> Paul's response to Everett here was, well, yeah, except for the, you know, two orders of magnitude in, in speed. Um, but, but I, I don't know. Maybe that two orders of magnitude in speed, you know, is based on some other assumptions. Um, so that's what we'll try to explore. Uh, oh, let's use a interpreter engine. Um, <clears throat> so the EVM versus Wasm shootout has been our latest um, mm -hmm. benchmarking focus. So it was like. Initially, it was just benchmarking all the WASM engines. Then once we found the you know, fastest WASM engines, in particular the fastest interpreter, then we benchmarked that against our fastest uh, EVM. Um, you know, we, we have to do this shootout because when, you know, when we're presenting WASM as a solution for ETH2 or as something that's going to bring a benefit to uh, ETH1.x, um, we have to compare it to, to EVM. So, so here's a benchmark. Um, it's SHA-1 and Wabbit 
is fastest. Um, EVM one here is their is our fastest um, EVM interpreter. So WebAssembly is about twice as fast. We cannot read the labels. Uh, Casey, can you just read the labels for us from left to right? Would you mind? Yeah, sure. So this is Parity EVM, Geth EVM, uh, Life uh, EVM one, Wasmi, and Wabbit. Uh, Wabbit's the fastest. Wabbit's the fastest there. So that was shot one. Then Blake two B. Um, again. So here's Geth and Parity, and then EVM one. And so here the three WebAssembly engines are faster than all three EVM clients, um, except. Now here's some different <laughs> Blake 2B EVM code. Uh, so I don't have the, uh, th these, this is only the EVM, EVM implementations, but if we compare, sorry, compare the eight kilobytes performance number that's 2.4 milliseconds, uh, then it's actually uh, twice as fast as the fastest uh, WebAssembly, but this WebAssembly code also hasn't been optimized. Um, I, Paul's been working on some faster WASM code that we're, we're still going to add to the uh, the benchmarks and compare to the fastest um, like to be bytecode. Uh, um, Not here. No. Yep. That's. I'm going to get to that. So scoreboard here, uh, EVM one was faster on Blake two B and on SHA one, uh, Wasm was faster. Uh, so moving on to the two hundred fifty six bit workload. <laughs> this this test case um, I named it um, the Greg Colvin drag race. Because Greg uh, had warned us about about 256-bit workloads, um, actually, it was kind of funny. Even as recently as January, uh, at the 1.x meetup, I remember saying, "Like, wow, well, Ethereum's you know worst uh, premature optimization was that you know that hexery you know Merkle Patricia tree," and Vitalik was like, "Well, actually, I think it was the 64-bit." The 256-bit stack, but we didn't have these benchmarks at that time. So, and what Greg always said was, um, you know, yeah, EVM is slow. Of course, it's going to be slower. I mean, what what people, you know, the common wisdom. Yeah, EVM slow. I mean, using a 256-bit stack is so, you know, it's like, why would you do that? It doesn't match the architecture. Obviously, it's going to be slower. Um, but, and, and Greg would say, well, actually, on, that should make it faster on 256-bit workloads, which was totally true. So this was like V8 interpreter and Wabbit. So this is the fastest WebAssembly interpreter, 1.8 seconds. And here's you know our fastest EVM interpreter at 11 milliseconds. Uh, yeah, so this was like a uh, <laughs> EVM, you know, a big like a Mike Tyson knockout for uh, for EVM against against Wasm, and I mean, even for that, Wasm was like left, you know, crying with his like ear missing. Um, <laughs> piece of its ear is missing. Anyway. Uh, so the other 256-bit benchmark is this, uh, the BN128 mall. This is the EC mall, the precompile that was added in Byzantium. So here, uh, fastest WebAssembly interpreter at 100 milliseconds, and the fastest EVM interpreter at uh, 500 microseconds. 
which is really fast. So 256-bit workloads, we declare the winner EVM. Well, wait, that benchmark wasn't fair. <laughs> Was the exact same algorithm used? No. Was one hand optimized byte code and the other some junky byte code generated by a crappy compiler? Yes. Um, was it a pathological test case not reflecting a real world use case? Yes. Uh, so, you know, there's lies, damn lies, and benchmarks. Um, but, I mean, we're doing our best. So, we're trying to make these benchmarks more apple to apple. Um, to you know, give a make it a fair match, uh, but that requires um, optimizing, like coming up with optimizing Wasm bytecode to benchmark. Um, it requires optimizing the engines for these workloads. These things take time. Um, yeah, the BN one twenty eight mall that was really really fast. Ask me about it later. Um, but first. Let's start with a rematch with uh, MOL 256. Um, so this is like scenes from Rocky. This is like Rocky training for, uh, I don't know, for his like, rematch, I guess. And th so um, this is supposed to represent us optimizing Wabbit for the rematch against EVM. Um, so the first optimization we did is uh, removing the host function overhead. S and we did this by, um, by decoding the WebAssembly where when it runs into, uh, when, it, when it parses uh, a call to a host function, it inserts in the intermediate representation um, an opcode. So we add an opcode to the implementation. It's not an actual opcode. Uh, in WebAssembly, this is just like a trick for Wabbit because it was like the, the easiest way to get to minimize the host function overhead in, in, in Wabbit. Um, so, <clears throat> yes, the, so when we looked at the, the cause of the slowdown on MOL256, it was like, uh, in order to do a 256-bit multiplication um, using 64-bit operations, um, it takes like, tw I think Pavel said um, 25 uh, uh, 64-bit instructions, whereas EVM does that in one. So just from the sheer number of instructions, that's like a, you know, a 25x slowdown. And what we saw was a 100x slowdown. Um, but so... Yeah, so just, um, so the idea here is uh, we add a host function for 256-bit multiplication so that it can be done in, you know, one instruction like it is on EVM rather than 25 instructions. Um, and the obvious API to use for this, for this host function is one that takes three inputs and returns none. Well, so it takes the, the, uh, the return pointer is, is, is an input. Um, so that's like it's going to multiply A by B and then put the result in the return point pointer. So the API is it, it pops three, pushes zero. Um, yeah, so here's like the return pointer and, you know, A and B, so forth. Uh, so this was, um, yeah, so this made it faster, but um, it was still kind of slow. And <clears throat> yeah, and I guess the, the issue with this one was, you know, all, all these local dot gets. So when you look at like the EVM bytecode, you don't have, you know, three gets and then a call and then three gets and then a call. You just give like, Mole, 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 mole. So, in order to uh, try to replicate that, um, we changed the API. So now this is a, it's still the same, you know, it does the same operation, but the host function uses a different API, uh, pop two, push one. 
And uh, so doing this made it even faster. And yeah, at this point, we're also starting to use this virtual stack idea, which I'll get into in, in a bit. Um, but it's still, um, EVM1 was still, uh, was still coming out ahead. So finally, um, Yeah, so finally I think to, to uh, so this was like almost, it was almost there, but uh, to finally push it over the, <laughs> over the threshold, we just basically like copied and pasted the code from EVM1, and um, it's, it's like, the, like we're kind of cheating a little bit, but it just pop, I mean, pop two, push one is the same as just a pop, so, and whereas in the in the last one we're like over here we're popping it and then um, I had an intermediate one where we're like uh, convert the types to a big int. Um, so this like this type conversion. Um, so in this one, so EVM one has uh, uses th these two hundred fifty six bit types, um, each stack element is already a 256-bit type, so you're not doing these type conversions on every instruction. So we did that too. Uh, and yeah, so we finally um, have Wasm beating EVM on, on multi-56, although um, now there are more optimizations on EVM1 that, that make it even faster, so maybe, you know, it's this back and forth. Uh, but yeah, but the scoreboard is at least even on that one. So a little bit more into this big num stack. Uh, so it's in this Wabbit file and terp.cc. And so the idea is um, the WASA module, we'll call it a host function that says set big num stack. And this allocates a space in the, in the WASM memory um, to use, uh, to store, you know, to store these 256-bit numbers, let's say. And uh, so it does this type conversion right up front, and then later when it operates, when host functions operate on this uh, big num stack, um, this is, you know, this is fast. And, you know, I, um, Sort of the vision how this would fit in with interpreters that don't have these host functions or compiler engines that don't have these host functions, they could be provided as uh, you know WASM functions rather than host functions, and um, maybe they'll be slower, but at least uh, you know they'll still work. So, you know, I mean, the whole goal here, Alex mentioned one idea was, well, sh do we should we add a 200 I-256 type to the WASM spec and then <laughs> have like custom WASM engines. That's what we don't want to do. Um, we want to stay compatible with the, with the WASM spec and you know, and so if you don't have, the idea would be if you don't have one of these optimized uh, WASM interpreters, it would still work but it just won't be as fast. Um, yeah, sure. So this is having people who are writing their code expect to program against this API. Oh, you got the mic right there. So this is having people who are submitting the code are going to write with using these, this big num as, as one solution. You could imagine right. having people write with the 25 moles recognizing that and replacing it if you've got the optimization um, so that it downgrades in terms of it's still standard WASM. And you just sort of say in, in your consensus ones where you want to go faster if I see a pattern that looks like it's actually a 256-bit thing, I'm gonna call out to a host function or a... Yeah, I guess doing that conversion would be a little more complicated. We're just at the stage where it's like, oh, well, if you use these host functions, then you know, it, it, it'll be faster. So the motivation is you can't recognize just from bytecode what's going to be a 256-bit multiplication? 
Yeah, you're making exactly a 100% good point that there are pattern matching in compilers to, to recognize when you're doing some algorithm and then they just swap it out, uh, all, you know, this huge chunk of code with just one with small thing, exactly, you're 100% correct. Where does it stop? Uh, uh, the compilers get more and more complicated, million lines of code, it's an arms race. How are we going to meter these things? Metering is a very hard problem, as you know. So, but you're 100% correct that that's an alternative uh, that some people are, are, are pushing for. Um, have you looked at adding a multiply that gives you the high half to WASM? Uh, have you looked at adding an instruction to WASM that would give you the high half of the multiply? Uh, if you had like a multiply low high, um, oh, oh, okay. that, that might make the algorithm faster. Uh, so as you know, the, uh, if you write your, uh, the modern architectures offer an I64 times I64 to I28, uh, 128, I'm sorry. Uh, WebAssembly I don't think offers that. Perhaps we, have, we can have some pattern matching that does that for us. Uh, but then again, where does it end? Uh, for that one, I think it would be a good, very, very good case. You're 100% correct. But there's to add yeah, personally, I'm not looking to add uh, any instructions to WebAssembly. I'll leave that to you know the WebAssembly experts. Um, I just want to add host functions. <laughs> adding an operation that that does a 64 multiply like that gives you the full house is a lot easier than adding a whole new type like div six. So. That out there. Um, yeah, so BN128 mall. This is really. I had just one yeah. one additional question on this. Why is 256 bit important to have? Like, what workloads actually need 256 bit? Uh, well, I can show that right in this next slide. Okay. The question is, this stack is only 256 bits, or is a variable number, a variable big number? Yeah, we envision it as 256-bit, um, 512-bit, 1024-bit, because there, there's other um, you know, curves that you know, require these uh, arithmetic on these large sizes, mo modular arithmetic. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but we're just starting with 256 right now in our experiments because that's the the size of the curve we're working with. So, um, yeah. So we we beat EVM for the simple uh, mole 256 uh, test case, which is uh, you know contrived and, and pathological. But BN 128 uh, multiplication is a real world use case. It's the same exact function in the uh, pre-compile that was added in Byzantium. And um, so what I just want to note here is, so this is the optimized bytecode implementing BN128 mall in an optimized EVM interpreter at about 500 microseconds. And this is the native Rust code doing it in 300 microseconds. And then this is Geth, which is uh, more optimized than Rust and coming in at 127 microseconds. But this EVM, <laughs> this EVM bytecode is actually not even uh, it can be made about twice as fast, according to the, the guy who wrote it. Um, he thinks because it was implemented using um, just regular multiplication and an elliptic curve. Uh, the, the arithmetic can be optimized using a technique called uh, Montgomery multiplication. The reason he didn't use Montgomery multiplication was because he was optimizing for EVM gas costs, not EVM speed, and um, the EVM op codes between mole and mole mod are uh, mispriced. So, you know, mole is a lot faster, but mole mod is, um, is, rel is, is cheaper than it should be, so mole mod is, is underpriced. But if, uh, if this Montgomery multiplication, um, if the EVM bytecode used Montgomery multiplication, instead of uh, mole mod, then 
it would be about twice as fast. And then, I mean, there's already uh, some pull requests on EVM1 that, that make it even faster. So um, already we're, we're approaching like the native uh, Rust. I mean, it's pretty close to native <laughs> using an interpreter, which um, I don't think anybody, well, I certainly didn't, didn't expect it. Um, if we had thought it was possible, um, you know, two years ago or whatever, we probably would have sat down and tried it. It was just assumed to be like, it would have been a waste of time because interpreters are so slow. You know, you'll never reach like native speeds. Um, but it was, it was like a, a just a coincidence that, um, you know, Zachary Williamson uh, implemented wire strudel. Which, by the way, he ended up beating the uh, the precompile in terms of gas costs four points four more when when multiplying more than one point. Um, so just the combination of that of uh, having this you know highly optimized EVM uh, EVM bytecode implementation plus an optimized uh, EVM interpreter, which Pavel wrote for fun on Christmas break. Um, this you know this last Christmas, uh, and it made it you know we have this like shocking result. Uh, I think so. So just for example, here's how the uh, while some compiler engines do on the same benchmark. Like um, I think these were run at different times, so the numbers are slightly off, but. Um, so here on the other benchmark, this native Rust would have been 300 microseconds. Here it's showing at 600. But you know, even the the fastest uh, optimizing compilers are still substantially slower than the you know it's 1.7 milliseconds, 3.5 for you know five milliseconds. Still substantially slower than the EVM interpreter, you know, coming in at 500 microseconds, which can Again, probably be made even twice as fast as that. Um, yeah, so this was wire strudel and then, uh, you know, EVM1. So, um, so what we're currently focusing on is, uh, yeah, seeing if we can get WASM to compete with this result. Um, this BN128 mall uh, on EVM. And uh, I mean, so one thing about these numbers here, like, so we're comparing these compiler engines to uh, an interpreter engine, but the WASM code that these compiler engines are running is uh, is is pretty junky, generated by um, generated by Rust, which um, frankly I'm not all that impressed with the WASM code it's been generating lately, uh, because you know we have to go in and hand optimize it. We, I guess, um, where was that? It was. Let me jump back. Yeah, so we were here with. Like out of the box, um, Wasm from Rust at 100 milliseconds, and so using some host functions, what we've got it down to, uh, well, just the the host function itself, um, switching to 256-bit host functions for add, mall, and uh, subtract. Um, then we had a we even had a host function for doing the Montgomery multiplication. Um, got it down to like. Uh, 15 milliseconds or something, and then uh, so then we started hand optimizing like the double and add uh, functions. So we're like handwriting those in Wasm, and then we got it down to maybe um, four or five milliseconds. But uh, yeah, so there's still a lot of work, um, you know, training to try to uh, come back and, and, and beat it in a rematch.
Yeah, and so our hope was w once we settle on a on a good big num API uh, that. Uh, so another idea that where we it might even be able to be faster than than EVM is is like uh, for EVM. Uh, when it does a modular multiplication, it always has to pass in the the modulus on you know on every instruction. Uh, we could design the host function so that you like set the modulus up front, then you don't need to keep you know add it, pushing that back on the stack and then calling it every time. So it's like uh, set and forget, you know, do a bunch of instructions. And then if you need to change it, you can change it. But um, these are yeah, this is the uh, the ideas we're thinking about for this like uh, big num virtual stack, uh, you know, big num API, big num wasm uh, host function API. Uh, maybe it could be uh, become a WASI standard, or maybe we'll just pretend that it's a WASI standard. Um, So uh, I keep hearing that you're doing these benchmarks on big num multiplication and what's fastest. I, I'm, I've, I, I don't know how, like the, I haven't worked with Ethereum uh, enough to know like, is it like the biggest, like, oh, not maybe the biggest, but most often or the, like the biggest bottleneck in Ethereum contracts because I, is it like, that people use this big num multiplication so much and so often that like the contract executions can be like improved so much that it's worth doing that. Like uh, smart contracts are supposed to be like general purpose, like like anything. It could be anything. So is this anything doing this big num multiplication so often that you have to you know like put that like design everything around it? Um, well, there's somebody in the audience. Uh, Jordy, who I know uses a lot of big num math, you want to answer this or? Yeah, and no? expect that someone who is doing a lot of big num math would need that. But you know, like how, like if you have you like I know, in investigated like what's like percentage of operations that Ethereum contracts are doing is using this big num multiplication and it's like it's the thing that we have to optimize the whole platform for or maybe it's like one percentage usage and we will do it anyway and the rest like 99% is like adding U32 and like passing strings around or like adding something to a map and updating the balance. Um. Well, we don't judge it by the like operations on the EVM because uh, the stuff that's slow, nobody deploys bytecode to do that. Let alone even tries to write bytecode. It's they will propose the precompiles. So when we look at what precompiles people are proposing, um, more often than not, it's the it's you know crypto curves that require these these big num stuff. The other than other than crypto. Uh, you know, curve arithmetic, curve oper uh, operations. It's um, you know, it's hashing hashing functions, but and hashing functions. I don't think they require they don't require this. Uh, uh, yeah, the big num they don't help with hashing functions, but um, but yeah, for the cryptography. Yeah. So to back up and to respond, uh, you're 100% correct. It, it could be the case that uh, business logic is the bottleneck and the crypto stuff is not the bottleneck. We have a conjecture. So it's you're right. It's it's it could be an open question. What is the bottleneck, and are we addressing the the correct thing? Uh, but yes, there's a huge huge demand for uh, this new heavy expensive crypto, uh, snark and stark stuff. Uh, so yes, we think that the bottleneck is the big enough stuff. So we're focusing 100%. Into the into that bottleneck, but it could be the case that you're right, and there are other more expensive bottlenecks, and we're going in the wrong direction. Um, but would um, Watson be support supporting then only the 256 uh, multiplication, or or also the 64 and 32 bit multiplication? Because it seems like for a lot of stuff, you really just want. Uh, 32 and 64 bits. 
uh, Wasm, Wasm has instructions for 32-bit. So yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, it Wasm, I suppose. Like when you're doing all of this um, optimization for the 256-bit multiplication, are you? Um, is that adding um, a new host function that you would be calling, or um, trying to see where this fit in, fits into the architecture? Um, well, yeah, for the 256-bit, it's, it's a new host function. If you then wanted to do like 32-bit uh, and 64-bit, you would read, uh, read those words from the memory and then you know, put them on the stack and then operate with them just using WASM instructions and then uh, you know, uh, copy those back to the big num virtual stack and, and the memory. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. I guess I'm maybe one more question. Uh, so I want to know. Uh, suppose you have uh, like a very decent. Oh, sorry. You have a very decent implementation of the compiler or interpreter, and you have a highly uh, or extremely optimized compiler or interpreter. Uh, what is the difference we can observe from the network or from the system? It's really a bigger like bottleneck network, but bottleneck. Uh, so if I understand correctly, um, what is the difference between like using optimized interpreter or uh, optimized or a compiler? Um, yeah, that's something we're interested in benchmarking. So, uh, you know, one idea we have is uh, if we have these optimized host functions, you know, uh, to do uh, Big num math, you know, we would write those in WebAssembly, and then um, then we also have, we'll have the optimized, um, uh, you know, logic that doesn't do that, that isn't the big num arithmetic, and then just run that in a you know in like V8 and see how it compares to this optimized you know uh, Wabbit with with the with the big num host function. So this is all these are all benchmarks that we want to run. Uh, yeah, uh, um, maybe I was not clear. So I, I mean that uh, if we have like a very decent implementation, just a normal uh, interpreter we can use right now, uh, nowadays, uh, is it a problem? Or, I mean, if we don't optimize it for today, it's like Ethereum could work well, even for nowadays, I mean, uh, for example, for Ethereum 2.0. If we just use the 64-bit instructions, then on, on interpreters, then um, no. The I mean, basically all the elliptic curve stuff is not practical. It takes multiple seconds, and you know when we need to be under 100 milliseconds. Ah, okay. I see. I see. Thanks. Any more questions? Any more questions? <laughs>